Hi, Michael. Hey, Karen. I'm good to see you today. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I'll never get used to this being a YouTuber. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm here today with Michael to talk about Esther Lightcap Meek and the covenantal knowing epistemology that she developed from the scientific ideas of Michael Polanyi. And the thing that fascinated me was that she got interested in him as a scientist, and that helped her to see a new way of navigating philosophy. And um, so I really like that intersection between science and philosophy. And I, I, I did some research on Michael Polanyi and on Esther Lightcap Meek, and I watched a few videos of her talking, and um, she's just a wonderful human being. Mm -hmm really fun spending time with her. And a, a couple of things that I picked up on um, were her idea, which is not new to her, but it's very interesting conversation, the difference between knowledge and information. Because so many scientists tend to look at information being the same thing as knowledge. And, um, and then also, it made me think about, l listening to her made me think about uh, Jordan Peterson and the, the connection that there is between the knower, the knowing, and the known, and the unknown. And that's a lot of what Esther, Esther Lightcat Meek is talking about, too. So here's a quote from uh, 12 Rules for Life in the chapter on truth. Mm -hmm. A vision of the desirable future links action in the now with important long-term foundational values. It provides a frame limiting anxiety and uncertainty. So this vision of the desirable future is what changes um, or guides our action in the now. And it, it connects us with long-term foundational values in a way that provides meaning and that's why it, it it provides a frame that limits anxiety and uncertainty and what we're facing in the world today are all these people who feel that they can't know I mean I, I know young people of my daughter's generation that say they can't know anything and that this produces a lot of anxiety and uncertainty because there's all this fear about what the future might be um, uncertainty about how to behave in the present in order to bring about a desirable future. And, um, and so that, I kind of want that to kind of frame our conversation, but I also want to um, look at Michael Polanyi's ideas about um, the structure of tacit knowing and then and why that affected Esther Lightcap Meek and and what she kind of got out of that and how she moved into this idea of covenantal knowing so i just want to throw it over to you whatever you've been thinking about of these two and then i'll i'll come in with um yeah i, I just i'm kind of at the beginning of the beginning of exploring uh michael polani's work but it, it's his stuff I haven't even started reading it. I've mostly been experiencing his thought through other people's kind of explorations, but um, it, it seems like he seems to be the a flip side of, of what Owen Barfield is doing more kind of in the arts. He's kind of taken that on in the sciences. Um, and if, if you could, you could think of Barfield kind of as a philosophy of arts kind of guy and Polanyi is kind of a, a philosophy of science. Um, both people that kind of they understood what they were they, they they became kind of fascinated with that uh kind of going up a metaphysical level and looking at what underpins this effort something that they were doing already uh in an embodied sense you know he was a scientist and barfield was um you know a writer and and he did did poetry and um you know he did children's books he did other things like so he was like exploring this um you know artistic space and then they just they, they decided that there was this need that something was happening you know specifically in the 20th, 20th century that um required them to somehow suddenly give justification to things 
that pre- previously didn't they seemed um, everybody understood them like there you didn't need to justify them and suddenly you 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 did um and so i i found that very um poignant and and also like that um as you were you were just mentioning you know kids today not feeling like they can know anything any longer that there's been this this this, this huge disconnect in terms of um knowledge and uh, what it shows me is that the the rationalist the rationalist frame is is ultimately self contradictory you know it 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 kind of if you if you try to make that you know send that to the top of the hierarchy um as um you know Jordan would say or you know paul's he likes this this phrase the monarchical vision where you try and it's it's this pretend place vision from from no person's perspective from nowhere but is supposedly is pretends at having the ability to encapsulate it all the all the knowledge and everything um that it's just not possible like there's something ultimately immediately self-contradictory about that you don't have to be that smart to 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 pick up on this like kids can pick up on this that there's kind of this endlessly self-referential uh kind of destructive um destructive element to that way of thinking that 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 leads to ultimately a sense of i i can't know anything for sure um which is um which is a horrible thing to feel you know especially as a young person in, in this day and age well so here's a quote from michael polani that, that fits right in with that um he says a free society that strives to be value neutral undermines its own justification but it is not enough for the members of a free society to believe that ideals such as truth, justice, and beauty are objective. They also have to accept that they transcend our ability to wholly capture them. The objectivity of values must be combined with an acceptance that all knowing is fallible. And um, Polanyi denied that minds are reducible to collections of rules. So he had this idea of the structure of tacit knowing, and that is that, and this is where I I need some of your thought because this sentence really kind of is very difficult for me to tap into. I kind of understand what he's saying, but uh, I'd like to explore it a little bit more. We experience the world by integrating our subsidiary awareness into a focal awareness. Yeah, I think I think what that's driving at is is kind of the, the very structure of consciousness itself, which is if you think of it, um, it's 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 just it's pulling in like think of think of consciousness or at least the part of you and I that are having this conversation. It's it's or the part of <laughs> the part of you and I that is kind of self aware of itself that. And that's kind of the portion that we, a lot of our articulated forms of knowledge rest in that sphere. But what he's, what he's picking up on is that that's kind of the tip of this iceberg that rests on this foundation layer of all this other stuff that's embodied that is completely ineffable. It could not be articulated. Like, um, and, you know, Esther Meek in a lot of her examples would use something like, you know, the skill of riding a bike, like, you know, what's, what's interesting about that is like, say like, you know, if you're the kid who's, who's trying to learn how to ride the bike and your, your parents are kind of shouting instructions at you about how to do it, it's not really helpful. Those instructions and what they mean have no meaning to you in your current state until you have the embodied sense of actually balancing on a bike and making it work. Then suddenly those words have meaning. Right, they they attach to something, but the the process of going through that is, it's it's mountains and mountains and mountains and mountains of more information that's that's being accumulated in your actual experience of trying to figure out how you how you balance on a bike, and then you know like the little short phrases that your parents are shouting at you to help you are completely worthless unless they can attach themselves to that foundational experience underneath, right? So like the, the parent thinks they're helping, but they're really not because those those words don't have anything to attach themselves to yet in that child's experience. 
and that's how we are like all this all this articulated knowledge which is what he would say is focal right it's what comes together but it's it's a distillation of many 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 more times information that's in our unarticulated and and couldn't and, and also couldn't be right it's our, the the articulation is a is a kind of encapsulation it's a best best attempt um but it it does not it does not contain within it everything that it's trying to describe it's it it's it's fallible does well, that so, make sense so yeah and so i i hear her also talking about this idea that well okay there's two things this idea that we need an authoritative guide when we're when we're learning something that's one aspect of if we're learning something one of the examples that she uses is uh how to fly a jet plane no one could ever learn to fly a jet plane without an authoritative guide to teach them first and also that if you're going to learn to do something like fly a jet plane or i think jordan peterson uses the example fix a helicopter you have to do the time you have to put in the time and and doing the time is not just putting in the time to study something but building a relationship with the knowledge looking at the 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 knowledge as a as a person almost that you're you're becoming acquainted with getting to know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which makes me also think about when you're talking about this iceberg of knowledge that's underneath that little when a child is learning to ride a bicycle yes we know we have to learn to balance but what does that mean that iceberg that's down there is not something that that the child can um learn just based on what they already know about anything else <laughs> That iceberg is actually something that exists. I, I think it's actually something that already exists in the universe that the child is somehow learning to tap into or, or build a relationship with somehow or that, come into this relational knowing with that body of whatever that tacit knowledge is that's going to allow that child to ride a bike. Right. I think, I don't know, it's just somewhere else I heard Esther say this where it's, um, there's an invitational quality to this knowing like there's a you're you're coming in like like as you said into a relationship with reality itself and you have to in some sense invite reality in you and um so there is there's there's kind of this dance where you invite reality in it comes in you respond to that and there's this kind of response response over and over again there's this um trend i don't, I don't i'm not i don't know the great words but it's certainly personal in nature right and it's interesting you know paul's been talking a lot on his channel about this um idea of this dichotomy between a spirit of geometry and a spirit of uh, finesse mm -hmm. which originates from the work of uh blaise pascal and the, the the geometry is is kind of our rationalism. It's it's all all of our theories and things that we we can distill down into a, an equation or a graph or things like that. And then the spirit of finesse is what we use when we we we're, when we don't we know we don't quite understand something. You know, it, it was kind of out of our reach. We have to like there's a sense of it's more art than science, and we're kind of like kind of reaching beyond ourselves to try and engage with it. And that's how we should interact with people. You know, we should have this sense of that there's something divine and transcendent beyond our ability to get our hands around. And people like it when you treat them that way. And they don't like it when you treat them as if they were a math equation to be solved. Or like, I can push this button and you will do X. People hate to be treated that way. And we often, you know, we'll, we'll because we, we tend to, you know, see the world in a certain way as it aligns with our goals, we can just start to see people in our path as either tools or obstacles for, you know, reaching those goals. And then we want to, you know, engage them with the spirit of geometry. Um, but there is something about us when we choose the spirit of finesse, when we choose even in re to treat reality itself as if it has personal aspects to it. I think that 
the more sophisticated part of even the the anatomy of our brain turns on suddenly we we're looking for the anomaly rather than being surprised by it we're inviting the anomaly we're inviting this this moreness this otherness to inform us rather than us coming to it with i know how to do this click this button and this will be the result yes it's such a a sad, shallow way to experience the world, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that I heard Esther say on a, a conversation that she was having was um, knowing a person is like knowing a rose bush, and knowing a rose bush is like knowing a person. And I had to stop a minute and think about that. And and it's really true that if you if you take the time to actually have a relationship with a rose bush, you're going to learn a lot about how roses grow and they will tell you what they need um, based on how they thrive. Whatever actions you take with them, they will then tell you what they need in order. You'll see the consequences in a way that informs your next step so that you know how to you know how to dwell with this rose bush and have a relationship with the rose bush. And if you have a good relationship with your rose bush, then you're going to have a beautiful thriving rose that's covered with gorgeous blooms that will um, delight you with fragrance and all of that. And if you just like the last few years, I have not had a relationship with my rose bushes. I've just allowed the gardeners to do whatever they're going to do. And yes, I get some roses and it's okay, but, but they look sad and lonely and <laughs> it's a very strange thing. And, and if you have relationships with people where you're just using people as, uh, as tools or as, uh, you know, whatever, I mean, you're going to get the same kind of thing. You're going to get people that are only peripherally of interest to you and you're going to lose this vast reservoir of, of beauty and um, knowing and all of that. And I, I found the quote, I think, that you were referring to with Esther. She said, reality graciously self-discloses to people who put themselves in the place to see it, to invest the necessary time. And so if you're trying to become a jet pilot, reality will disclose itself to you if you invest the time to learn everything that's necessary to become a jet pilot. Or if you're trying to get to know, the other example she uses is get, knowing your auto mechanic is just like knowing God. And knowing mm-hmm. God is like knowing your auto mechanic. If you actually be, in, begin to invest the time to know your auto mechanic, many truths will begin to reveal themselves to you. And, I, and so I started thinking about that just in terms of some of the things that um, Jordan Peterson talks about when he talks about really knowing a person, how you have to invest the time in asking questions and truly listening and trying to really understand what that person is saying. And when you begin to pursue that all the way down with a person or with a skill, or even with cleaning your room, if you're actually invested in going as far as you can take it, you know, we've talked before about how you fall into this pool where all of a sudden you see, oh, there's way more to this than I thought. Mm -hmm. The, The amount of information that opens up to me is vastly beyond anything I expected. You might start cleaning your room, for example, and just organize a little bit on the periphery and put a few things away. And then all of a sudden you realize, oh, there's this pile of things that's really bothering me that I can't approach because there are, like Jordan says, there are snakes in there. (laughs) That pile of papers is just too high right now. I can't face it because why? Well, then I have to start thinking about what's really going on in my own head and who I am as a human being. And all these things that I didn't know about myself and why this part of my room is so disorderly. And so everything just begins to 
um, become larger and larger and larger, that bigger pool of information becomes available to us about ourselves and about the world that we're in. When we really start trying to know anything, whether it's a person or a task, um, we just discover there's way more. I'm, I'm just rambling right now, but I think you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And you I think you recognize it, your own known and unknown parts and your own hamartia, your own missing the mark kind of stuff. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, it's, it's, um, these two different ways, like the, the spirit of geometry and the spirit of finesse are, are always all, always both are active simultaneously all the time. You know, we're kind of, you know, in what, 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 what what has happened is for whatever reason in the West, we've privileged um, the, the spirit of geometry as, as being superior in terms of, and we've, we've lost this capacity or capability of integrating the two. Um, and, and so like, if, if you can't provide a sort of equation for your knowledge, um, then it's, it's not considered real knowledge. Like it's, it's, it's false. It's, 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 um, unscientific. It's, 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 um, it's not worth having. It's kind of to, to be discarded. And, um, that, that message is being presented to us all the time. Um, and in ways that even, and what's funny is, you know, it's, 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 a, in some ways it, you can, you can look at it as kind of an outgrowth of, of, uh, Christianity, um, specifically, some of the work of the Reformation in terms of um, having this, this kind of imagined precision uh, of, you know, getting more and more correct. You know, I, I think the Reformation ultimately had, you know, it was, you know, the, the intentions were good, but there was also other th things that set into motion, which, which are negative. And I, I don't, I don't know what, what, how this all plays out in the end, but it, it's clear to me that, the the new atheist in the kind of modern scientific rationalist framework couldn't it's it's a branch on the on the trunk of tr Christianity it couldn't have existed prior um, prior to that because even this idea that that there would be this extreme ability to understand the world and that this confidence in, in a, a sort of coherence was um, was that it was created by a God who 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 a created us with the ability to understand it and also set these things in an orderly way so that um, we could they'll go explore his thoughts after him and, and this discovery of science. So um, there's something in it that's good. It's obviously brought enormous benefits to the world, but there's also something uh, we've just kind of swung so far in a certain direction right now that we've become blind. It's even hard to, I think I I find even, and the difficulty we have in talking about these things is kind of um, due to um, um, how how uh, how off balance we've become. Well, maybe that's where this um, distinction between knowledge and information comes in. Because I notice that most of the scientists I listen to tend to think that information is the same thing as knowledge. And I was listening to a, a lecture by Paul Davies this morning that he gave at Google about the demon in the machine. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a very, very interesting lecture. And he really went into some detail about what they have discovered just recently about information and the role of information in the construction of the universe and, and how information relates to matter and energy and that information actually is a fuel and can be used to produce um, energy. And, um, and then he, he took a look at, at the organism level, how um, all these molecular machines are so complex and so filled with potential information and he as he began to describe the way the universe really breaks down when you get down into the organic end of things i mean you can i think you can see so clearly that this has got to be 
there's got to be something beyond strictly um, formulas involved in this. Mm -hmm. But he immediately moves to, therefore, we need a new physics. And this new physics will be new equations. And in the new equation, there will be uh, a factor where information is one of the factors in the equation. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the new physics will not just be quantum particles, but it will be quantum particles plus information. Yeah. And that's going to solve everything. Now we're going to know everything because we have, but, but what he's saying basically is that information and knowledge are the same thing, but information is really just one subset of knowledge. Knowledge goes way beyond information mm -hmm. unless you throw away everything that has to do with any sort of feeling or emotion or intuition or perception or um, just the way that we see. Yeah, the it's, it's interesting the, how the scientists unprivilege all those emotions and, and perceptions. But the thing is, well, you, you have to ask them, well, why did you become a scientist? What was it? What emotion in you stirred you to see this as being so relevant and interesting and useful that you, you had to do it? What made you fall in love with physics or whatever these things are? Like what, why do these questions seem relevant and useful? None, none of those are scientific questions. They don't, they don't have a one plus one equals two kind of answer to them. Um, and yet, yet they would, they would try and privilege, you know, the one plus one equals two as higher than the, why did did I love it to begin with? Oh, that's just some quirk of, you know, biological existence. Who knows? You know, it's not really useful to talk about, but, um, that's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's weird. Cause that, that's way more foundational in terms of your capacity and ability to, to become a scientist or anything is how much, how much do you love it? Again, what, what ability do you have to have this patient, uh, relationship with that thing if you can't the only way that you can do that is is if you if you love it and and where does that come from you know uh, th that doesn't seem to them to be an interesting question for whatever reason well even even what question a scientist frames that's going to guide his experiments in the future why does he choose that particular question every science i mean the 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 great discoveries have been made by scientists who have asked sometimes pretty random questions that seem to just come from nowhere. And it's the following the thread of that question that allowed them to make the discovery that they made. So um, I think the whole thing of just discovering the right questions is part of what builds the future. And the, where are the questions coming from? Yeah, I think this is, again, all, all of it is uh, substantial subsidiary right all the questions bubble up from who knows where it, it's it's in that the bottom of the iceberg you know all your experiences all this information you've interacted with and something bubbles up and says this is a question and i think that that kind of pulls onto something else that i found interesting you know in, in this discussion which is um i don't know i think i sent you this a while back that uh something called uh, from dc schindler uh, a writer about Unsurprised by Truth, um, where he talks about like that, um, you know, there's there's a surprising element in 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 any sort of discovery, and that you know reality has this nature to it that like reason in and of itself, its proper use leads us to things that are surprising to truth uh, to to reason like that, that exist outside reason's capacity or capability to have predicted. Um, so it's like this guide, this ruler, but it, it's only useful when it points beyond itself. If it tries to be t the totality of things, it, it's, you know, you get locked in a box that nobody can live in and it's kind of very dead, but you know, the proper use of reason points beyond itself. And, you know, he, this is the same guy. He had that lecture on on wonder and how philosophy and all knowledge begins in wonder, which is is something of what you were saying of that question. What what moves you to have wonder 
is is that those questions that bubble up and, and he his idea that that all knowledge is built on wonder and it's a moving from a a imperfect kind of naive childlike wonder to as we get and learn more we become even more um the wonder itself becomes perfected as we get closer to the mystery that is reality so his idea is that you know at the heart of everything is some sort of mystery and you know we would as christians would conceptualize that as god and and and, and um but there's a mysterious quality of that and as you get closer to it your sense of uh of having um been able to to know things your sense of what you don't know is increased and magnified and you know uh, the dimensions all the the universes of information that you know you don't know suddenly are start unfolding themselves to you um, rather than what you see is the opposite movement in this kind of new atheist where you're kind of you you're whittled down into these smaller and smaller boxes of kind of presumed uh knowledge of 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 everything that exists and you you have pronouncements from people like sam harris where he's like okay we're gonna one day we'll know exactly why um you know that little why you turned left at that right light or why you um you know you became a murderer or other things we'll all know all those things and that they were all determined by this you know this structure of reality that that from his perspective is all predetermined from the big bang you know it's just like a it's just a big math equation that's unfolding there's no there's there's nothing to wonder about it's really just a math equation you know and that's why we should privilege the the math you know the rationalism so so what it breaks down to into then is sort of a difference between developing a relationship with the unknown which is very dynamic and leaves lots of room for um growth and exploration and yeah. on the other side having a certainty about your relationship to the known we know all this stuff we know you know the scientists know all these things and here's all the little boxes and here's where we fit inside those boxes and that's it that's the known mm -hmm. um this they, maps well on too there is some unknown but their unknown is very targeted they have a very targeted unknown and their very targeted unknown is we're going to figure out how this all happened without any outside interference that's my target yeah. well, for for their frame of reference we we know everything right i mean at least in terms of the broad frame we have it mostly filled in like we know ex the ex pretty much the exact age of the universe you yeah. know we know within microseconds what happened after the big bang I mean, we, we have the broad strokes. We know that all of life descended from a single ancestor. Like the, the, the broad strokes in their mind are all so filled in. And it's just these little tiny boxes that you go get your PhD in that we haven't figured out yet. Yep, yep. Um, versus I think, but here's the problem is I, I don't think you can do any learning without humility. And the humility, so you, you can't ever find out the, the answer to questions that you aren't willing to ask. And the only thing that enables you to ask it is that sense of wonder, that sense of humility, that sense of, I don't, I don't think we know the answer to this, you know? So it, it would, in terms of like, you know, Jordan Peterson's map versus unmapped territory, if you think this ter territory is mapped, you can't ever explore it. And we live in a time where we think we've mapped everything, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so there's nothing left to explore. And so I think, um, I think that's a big part of what Peterson's done is tried to say, Hey, a lot of this is actually unmapped. You know, we, we don't really know ourselves as well as we think we do. And he kind of makes convincing, compelling arguments for that. Well, and there's really a lot of hope. There's a lot of hopefulness in that because what I, what I run into with some of these young people is we already know everything. We know everything. And what we know is we can't know anything. So we already know that. So why even bother? Why? Why even care about a future? What does it mean anyway? It doesn't right. matter what it means because we already know. It, and and they, they get in this cycle where, the, where that's their mantra. And of course, if that was the way I looked at the world, it would be very bleak and hopeless and nihilistic and, and a meaning crisis. Yeah. Well, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a deadly combination of, you know, the, the, the kind of... Uh adolescence 
um, overconfidence that we all probably experienced at one point in our life where we kind of think we, we know quite a bit along with this, um, this rationals frame, the two of those come to, coming together. Um, cause I mean, I, I can remember a time in my life where I thought I knew a lot more than I do now. <laughs> and, you know, luckily, you know, you, you get that knocked out of you by just, you know, just, just try to do anything, you know, I, it, where that, and this is where, you know, uh, Peterson says, you know, the, the transcendent reveals itself to you in error. So unless you, you, that's why you really need those goals as small as they may be, as small as they may be like in terms of cleaning up your room, because that's where the transcendent reveals itself to you. When you, when you commit yourself to a goal, when you say, I'm going to love doing this thing enough that, I'm going to get from point A to point B along that path. You take a completely different route than you thought you would, even for, for something relatively simple, like cleaning your room, you're going to, you find out a lot more about yourself and about the world than you, than you would have thought. Um, and that's, but I think we have a time period now where we, so much of what we consider uh, to be, to be human now is suddenly transcribed into it's like a, we, we are supposed to receive things from the outside world in rather than do things or having our mark on the world. It's like we watch Netflix or we, um, you know, live in these digital worlds where we kind of glancingly interact with other people's consciousness rather than kind of deeply um, try to understand them or interact with them. So it's, um, I think what that does do is again, it, it hides so much of the errors of our thinking from us. So we, we believe that we, again, especially for young people, they already have that kind of bent towards overconfidence, which I think you need when you're young too, because otherwise you maybe you couldn't get out of bed in the morning, right? If you don't have some sort of overconfidence. So it, it's, it's meant to have, give you the overconfidence to go do something stupid so you can learn something. But we have that overconfidence with this rationalist frame of we know everything already. There's nothing left to explore. And then it doesn't, it doesn't, it kind of, it, it's really deadly. You know, there's those two reinforcing each other, I think. That's a really interesting um, paradox there with the, the need for overconfidence, kind of balancing that. Because <laughs> I remember back when I first started painting, I really, I thought I could do anything. I, I thought I could conquer any, I had, if I find a photograph in a book and I think, oh, I want to paint a picture of that and I can do that, you know, and I, off I would go and I would try to paint that picture and, and it was really pretty awful. But um, it took me a while to figure out how awful it was. And in the process of getting there, I got a lot of experience of painting, of at least trying. <laughs> and when I finally realized, Oh, I'm not doing it right. Not at all. Um, but, but at least I had the, because I had the overconfidence to think I could do it, then I actually experienced doing it. If I had not had the overconfidence, I wouldn't have even tried because mm -hmm. I'd be like, oh, I, I can't do that. And then I wouldn't even try. And, 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 and then you, I, I run into a place in my artistic work right now where I can't do that. I, I can't, I can't achieve the thing I want to achieve. And so I'm sort of stuck. Yeah. And when we were just talking, I realized that this, uh, what if this kind of wonder thing that you were talking about with scientists, that used to be a big part of my art making because I'd be, I'd be working along on something and then I would have this idea. Well, what if I threw this in there? Or what if I did that? And I would just sort of plunge in and do it. And then that would open up whole new worlds to me. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the what if would come about because I'd be thinking about some problem that I had in the upper left-hand corner that wasn't resolved or something. And I would go to bed at night thinking about that. And I'd actually have dreams. And the dream would inform me about something. And I'd wake up in the morning, I'd think, oh, I have an idea. And I'd go try it, you know. But if I don't have the what if questions, then I don't have the sense of wonder if I'm not pondering the problems, then I don't get that sense of what if all of that doesn't happen, then I'm really afraid to tackle it again, because I don't have the answers, I don't know what to do. And so it's all this thing about it's this whole relationship again between the knower 
and the known and the no and the unknown and i found it so interesting that esther lightcap meek brings those three out and jordan peterson also brings those three out but they're coming from such divergent directions he's coming strictly from the whole narrative structure of all of the the formative documents of our religion and our history and all of that kind of thing and she's coming at it strictly from this idea of of um, relationship to truth and information and um I just thought it was so interesting that they both come to the same conclusion. Yeah, it makes me think of DC Schindler. He, he had a word for his version of truth was, I think it was dramatic truth. And what he, what he meant by that was this sense of what truth is, is it's, it has this kind of folded up quality to it that, that unfolds itself to us over time, the, the same way a story does. And so that, uh, you know, again, like you, you, you come to some kind of twist or turn in, in your own life narrative and you think it means one thing. And then further down the line, other plot points reinterpret the whole thing. So like suddenly, suddenly the meaning of the, the previous portion of your life is completely different. So there's this continuous unfolding of, of reality that, that has, uh, has it, has this time element to it that, that, hides and slowly unveils all this this extra level of, of detail and complexity it's almost a picture of how dna has been unfolding itself to us as a as a society ever since they first discovered it we keep getting deeper and deeper and deeper levels of it unfolding more and more and more information which is providing more and more insight I mean, if you look at it as a, an infinite well, then you're gonna get one picture of it. If you look at it as a finite box that has a certain amount of information in it, and we're gonna to get to the bottom of it one of these days. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Those are two completely different ways of looking at it. If you see it as this infinite well, it, here's an example, like with DNA, you know, they say that 95% of it is just junk. And they used to say 97% of it was junk and 3% of it was, was vital to knowing what all the parts are to whatever has the DNA in it. And then over time, they found a few of those pieces of junk actually are very vital pieces yeah. of information. It, but it, the other 95% is probably also very vital information. We just don't know what it is. Yeah, this is, this is uh, what, what they call junk is, is really what they mean is random, which is, Paul always points out that we just, when we use that word random, we, we just, what we're really confessing is that there's a pattern here. We aren't smart enough to figure out because it, it, obviously it's not random or we wouldn't, you know, if 95% of the, our, our genetic code was random, we would, that would, that would not produce us. <laughs> we're too complex. I mean, this is one of the things they're finding. Like, you know, when they, when they started going through the genetic code, they, they, they had to focus on certain, it's a lot of data. And so they focused on certain things, you know, that they could understand. And so one of the, the easiest bits to understand was like the really large proteins in the body because they think, okay, well, they're really large. So they're really important. And now what they're finding is that there's all these smaller proteins that, that are coded for that they thought weren't as important because they were smaller portions, but they actually, you know, dramatically and, you know, change. Like if you have this, this tiny little portion off, you have a certain disease or, or, um, you know, maybe even have some sort of adaptation for a, a particular climate or something like that. So it's, it's like you said, it, it really is this infinite well, um, which is, is the correct mode to, of an, interpreting it rather than, you know, thinking that, yeah, we're going to have this all mapped within the next few years because it's going the opposite direction. <laughs> Well, and, and I like what Esther Lightcap Meek talks about when you talk about pattern. She said, knowing is the responsible human struggle to rely on clues to focus on a coherent pattern and submit to its reality. Much of the pattern making process is inarticulable. So this the the iceberg is really, I mean, 
what, the iceberg that's underneath learning how to ride a bicycle or that's underneath um, understanding what consciousness is, that, that big iceberg that's underneath all of these things that we only see a tiny bit at the top. Or, you know, the 97% of random, randomness in the, in the DNA. All of those random things are, are actually um, a pattern that we just can't see yet. Mm -hmm. So knowing is... And also, and also your ability to imbibe it is personal to you. You know, like, yes. that, that, that's a big thing. With like Paul Planning's seminal work was called personal knowledge. So like the, the exact way that, that say you it, structure your, your framing of riding a bicycle is completely different than me. Even though it's the same activity, it's specific to your body and, and all these things that are unique to you, your emotional states, all these things. It's very, very personal to you. And it's funny because when you were talking about that, it made me think of, you know, I don't know if you've seen the movie, The Matrix, mm -hmm. where like, you know, he, he like, it's the complete opposite thing there where like, they're like, they just upload the codes into him for knowing Kung Fu and all these martial arts. And like, he, like within a second, it's uploaded to his brain and he comes out and he's like, I know Kung Fu, you know? And he's like this ma like master level martial artist, which the idea being there that, oh, whatever the, whatever it is to be a master of Kung Fu is it's, it's universal. Like you could just upload it to that brain and that brain and that brain and that brain and that brain, which is a completely different idea than what you were just articulating, which is, it's actually really personal to me and my experience and all these things. And even if it could be, you know, boiled down to some structure that I could upload into somebody else's brain, it wouldn't it wouldn't work in their brain, you know, it, it's because it's personal to you. If that makes sense. Well, absolutely. It's personal to you because, because, and you use the word matrix and I use the word matrix when I try to describe this because I don't know what other word to use, but um, it's like when we're born, we're just a, a framework that in itself is very mysterious to me that we have the framework, but that framework is what um, knowledge and growth and information and maturity and all those things kind of begins to fill in as we mm -hmm. go from being babies to being adults. And that's being filled in with data input from our parents and language learning and experiences that we have and music that we hear and books that we read and relationships that we develop and bicycles that we ride and all of those things are filling in that mesh mesh network or mesh matrix that we are and so my whatever i am myself is completely unique to me and yourself is completely unique to you and and that means that even our matrix, our framework is completely unique so that whenever new information comes into us, it gets integrated in a very personal and individual way. And mm -hmm. whenever information flows out of me to anybody else, it's coming out through that framework and you're receiving it through your framework. So, Which makes it completely mysterious that we can communicate at all. Exactly. Which <laughs> Which, which tells you that there has to be, in my mind, some sort of spiritual reality as well. Something that's able to leap across these huge gaps and to, you know, to make something to, to unite from the many, you know. It's even mysterious. Like, this is we are in him and he is in us and he is with us. So that's the that's the common mesh matrix yeah. i don't know there's, what there's some know. medium that we're communicating through yes. other than yes. just sound you know there, there has to be in my opinion i mean it's it, it's interesting to see that this dynamic though between the the, the idiosyncrasy synchronicity of the individual but then there's this you know this sense in which we're all the human race is a big family as well that we're all connected you know, in very deep ways, mm -hmm. you know. Well, I really liked what Esther was talking about in this one conversation when she was talking about the one and the many and the, the idea of the Trinity and um, 
I should put a link on here to that conversation because I can't do it justice by any means, but but it's this idea of kind of the the dance. Um, not that um, oh, I wish I could put it I, I can't put it into words, but I'll I'll put a link to it because it's such a great picture that we, we tend to always see things. She was talking about how we tend to always see these false dichotomies, mm -hmm. that somehow we see a dichotomy between fact and value, or between reason and faith, or between mind and body, or theory and application. But she said, actually, these are not, they're not separate things. They're, they're a unity, they're a dance that's going on between these things. And so when, because of our Western viewpoint, that's our default setting to see those as two separate things. And when um, scientists will try to shut somebody out of the discussion by saying, well, you're coming into this with a presupposition of faith, therefore you can't be a part of this discussion. She said, everybody comes into a discussion with some presupposition. Mm -hmm. Everybody comes in with their own um their own way of knowing or their own preconceptions based on some particular set of ideas i think she used the word some objective i don't know there's some philosophy word that they use commit belief commitments everyone comes in with their own belief commitments and so you can't ever assume that somebody is just completely this neutral force when they come into a conversation they all have a belief commitment but um this this idea of the god being with us is this this eternal dance that goes on and that allows fact and value to be united and also to be infinitely divisible you know that it always takes me back to Chris and his picture of how calculus is the way the world is constructed, you know, mm -hmm. with the, the one and the many. I love that picture. Well, it also makes me think of what, what, where Christianity is, is unique among all the religions in terms of the incarnation. And I, I think the, the incarnation is this, again, this cosmic event of, of tremendous significance because again it's all about this this unity this coming together between heaven and earth that is that is unique to christianity i don't you don't see it anywhere else and and this is you know i was just reading through ephesians which is a book that has had a lot of impact on my life and just um i actually memorized the whole thing at one point and i don't think i could even do verses from it now but there's something about that book where you know it's it's a lot of people think it's one of the last ones that paul wrote and they even think that maybe it wasn't even specifically read, um, written to the Ephesus. Maybe it was like this cyclical, like, cause it's kind of compressed. He doesn't call out people by name in it as much. And it, but it's this kind of compression of the whole gospel within Ephesians. It's only six chapters and they're very compressed. He has all these long run on sentences in it. Um, but this idea of God's, wisdom his manifold wisdom which i really like that phrase manifold wisdom it's that sense of unfolding it's got many facets and they're kind of like hidden within each other that that but it's being revealed now in christ in the fullness of the church but that also um all things are going to be brought together in christ all things in heaven and earth like there's this um this and and it's it's he it, i just i just love the language it's just the, the sense of cosmic significance to to everything coming together uh in christ and i think that that is unique in christianity where all these dichotomies what we think of are all brought together and, and have some significance and it does make me think too um i think this is another topic i put down which is like this whole christ versus antichrist spirit and i think the the spirit of Christ is the spirit of, of unity, and there is this this other work that you see, which is this 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 divisive breaking the world into all these pieces and parts away from each other. That you can even, I think, I don't. I, again, some people would would probably get 
bent out of shape from this thing, but I do see elements of it working in the Reformation where you have all the church breaking into all these different parts. And if you go look at why they, why are we not in fellowship with these people over here? It's like, it's about the meaning of this word here. We disagree that this word means this and we think it means that. And so we, we, uh, we go here on Sunday and they go there. And that's this long history of that going on. And I think, I think secularism and atheism is just one other branch off of that, where it's like, well, suddenly we don't need this magic of, uh, of, you know, of the supernatural anymore, but we still want to take all the ethics and other values with, with it. Um, and we want to have our, you know, sympathy for the oppressed and the minorities and all that. We'll, we, we'll, we'll take that, but we, we're going to, we're going to write out some of the other stuff. And I do think there is, um, I don't know, there's something interesting going on with this Jordan Peterson phenomenon where a lot of these definitions are being redrawn and, and people that are calling themselves atheist Christians, like they, there, there's some sort of redrawing of the, the basic maps of this that, um, I don't know, I'm interested to see how it plays out. Well, I think, I think part of that is, um, well, going back to what you were talking about with the, um, all the different kind of schisms and divisions, it goes all the way back to um, Genesis chapter 12 when, when God told Abraham, everyone is going to be blessed through you. Mm -hmm. But even then, the, the people decided to keep it to themselves, not spread it to everybody yeah. else, because this is our secret, right? And, and then when you get into the, um, since the Reformation, there is, um, I had one missionary friend say to me one time that he had this theory that what happens is that God reveals himself in a new, some new aspect of his man, manifold witness, some new aspect to a person. Let's just take, for example, um, uh, West, the, Wesley, the Wesleyan movement. You know, your heart is strangely warmed, and so there's going to be this more emotional aspect to your faith, and, and that becomes Methodism. Mm -hmm. That God reveals himself in that way so that you can tell everybody, and it becomes a part of the whole body. But what happens instead is, oh, we've got this new thing. That's our thing. We're going to keep it to ourselves. Mm -hmm. We're going to have our own little club. And then along comes the, uh, the charismatic renewal at Azusa Street in 1907 or whatever. Somebody gets some aspect of God and then, oh, that's our thing. We're going to keep it to ourselves. And so every new group that comes along gets another part of the picture of God, but then it isolates into a group because that's our human, sinful, Yep. tendency to want to hold things tight instead of keeping an open hand yeah. and control it and put our name on it yeah ra so rather it's it's as we're, we're worried about the zero-sum game if i let go of this i'm not going to have as much of it anymore instead of the generosity of if i give this out i'm going to have more of it and and god is a god of generosity and abundance and the more we give the you know the more that everybody has so um I, and, and I think part of the reason that the Jordan Peterson phenomenon is so interesting is that it doesn't um, it doesn't lend itself to being some little secret that you can hold on to for yourself because it doesn't make any sense unless you put it out there for further conversations to kind of unfold it. There's something in this thing that has to be unfolded across time and space with a lot of different participants looking at it from their perspectives to actually get a handle on what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like this. Uh, I always conceptualize it like he's created this new space that uh, we're now exploring. It was always there, but uh, just it didn't. It didn't. People, I think, didn't see that it, there was there was the possibility of having a conversation about it. Um, you know, it, and so there is something like I, I know a lot of people get into like this whole divide between articulated versus unarticulated, and like which one's superior. But you, you kind of you need both, right? It's the map versus unmapped territory. You need you need the map because it, it helps you and other people get in the same place and go, all right, let's go and explore that and kind of 
actually triangulate on what the mystery is to explore next and you know what is the meaning of all this and and so again i i, I don't know i guess we we need better models of how how those become integrated because it's it's easy to to go the opposite way and be like okay well we're just gonna everything's a mystery and we can't you know if you try and articulate anything then you're you're uh you're you're running afoul of that rule i think there's 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 some balance between the two and and we need I, you, you know what i really want is like the church to become more of a thinking place you know where you can have questions and you know you can have these kind of conversations and they're invited like it's not there's there there isn't a sense of in in the protestant world like if you say the wrong thing people like it hurts like immediately because it's like it's suddenly their world's been challenged like if somebody just happens to like you know have a different view about the incarnation or something like that it gets very heated very quickly even though like it it's not like we're proposing going out and murdering people or like rechanging anything basic but like I don't know we don't have there's we become so rigid in what we think our version of of right is that we can't we can't entertain the possibility the mystery the wonder the questions anymore within the confines of church which is why it's it's spilled out into this space that peterson has kind of shown us and and i think that arises out of a, a fear it's a fear thing it's a fear of the unknown if you're it's a fear of plunging into the unknown. Let's put it that way. And it's also a belief that we, what we're saves us is our propositional confession. That getting those right, it's it's a form of that rationalism. If I if I if I do these five things, which I can point to these scripture verses for, I win. I go to heaven. I'm right. You guys are wrong. It's it's very kind of procedural nature. Which if you if you read the parables of, of Jesus, like you're like, no, that's not. It doesn't seem to have much to do with what he's going after at all. Well, I think that's true for, I think that's probably true for a lot of people, but I also think there's another thing there that is, at least in my own experience, I can remember feeling this way that I knew I didn't know enough to be completely confident. The only thing I could hold on to is that, so, so, Am I responsible for holding on to myself in faith or is he responsible for holding on to me? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and I've had to come to the place where I believe that Jesus makes himself responsible for holding on to me because he says, nobody will be taken from me. So it's, it's not yeah, something that no one can take that out of my hand. Right? So, but if, if I'm, if I don't know that for sure, then any mistakes that I make or any, inadequate knowledge that i have so it it, it, i remember walking through a bookstore one time 15 years ago when i was going through a period of struggle and there was sam harris's book and i just picked it up because it said something about god on the cover and then i saw what it was about and it terrified me down to my core like i'm i would be afraid to read this book because what if he said something that stole my faith from me and then I would fall into chaos. Yeah. And but that's not that's not the basis of our faith. All of that knowing and all of these uh, bits of information that Sam Harris might have or not have is not the basis of what makes me safe. It's knowing that Jesus is holding on to me and and so when I came to that place finally then there was no more fear. Yeah. What's interesting, like, you know, like, because it's the question of like, what, where does your confidence lie? What is it in? I think that is a real problem in the Western church because, you know, for a long time, it might be like, okay, you know, with, with the, the Protestant Reformation in Luther, it's like, you know, sola scriptura means it's all scripture based. So if anybody finds that, you know, we have some doubts about this manuscript or that manuscript or the wording was different or anything like that, you've now thrown that whole system into disorder. So, um, I think, you know, one of the interesting things, you know, uh, Esther Meek points out in relation to Michael Polanyi's work is that we can, we have confidence that we've had some sort of contact with reality. Um, I think I wrote this down so I can get it right. Um, When you have a sense of unspecifiable future prospects. So it's, 
it's weird. It's, it's a future, it's a hope thing. It's like a, so like in the example she gives is like, okay, so once you've learned, you know, you've learned to ride a bicycle when suddenly your, your, your sense of the world and possibility. Now you're thinking about all the places you can ride the bicycle to like your sense of what the world is and what you can do with it has changed and been altered with this extra sense of possibility because of what you learned in terms of learning the bicycle. So that there's a sense in which those there's, there's possibilities out about our future with God that give us confidence that we've made contact with, with the reality that he is, um, which is, I, I is very interesting. I think, I, I mean, it's, it's hard to ground that. It's like, well, that's not really, there's no equation for saying, okay, do, do I have unspecifiable uh, future prospects here? But it is something kind of, it's like a nice, I don't know, rough guideline. And I think when I think of, you know, unspecifiable future prospects, I also think wonder, like that's wonder and gratitude are the two like emotions that I think of like, because again, it's a sense of, of the future and hope and all the things I can do and explore now that are open suddenly that, that didn't exist prior. Well, I remember watching my daughter grow um, from a baby and I, it became very obvious to me that every time she was about to step over a new threshold, like learning to crawl for the first time or learning to walk or learning to speak, you could almost see the wheels in her mind. There's something over there I could get if I could just get there. Mm-hmm. How am I going to get there? And, and then when, when it went from crawling to walking, it is I could get over there a lot faster if I could figure out some way to get beyond the crawling. But every time that it was in that just prior to achieving that skill, she would become very frustrated mm-hmm. and, and act out in a lot of really negative ways. <laughs> and, and I don't think that we change all that much as we grow when it comes to crossing those thresholds. And, and one of the ways I think we deal with that frustration now is we pretend those places don't exist. That we, we Yeah, because of fear. Yeah, because it because, yeah because something might fall out from underneath us. When when you're a year old, you feel invincible if you get up and you fall over. You get up and you fall over. But when you're 40, 50, and you fall over, maybe you're going to break something. You're not invincible anymore. You become aware that airplanes crash and there's there's too many unknowns all of a sudden, right? Yeah. I remembered what Esther said about the Trinity. <laughs> she said. And, and she was quoting somebody else who was saying, when you think about God being unchanging, you have to think unchanging does not only mean static. Unchanging can also have the meaning of faithful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's two completely different paradigms, right? So if unchanging is faithful, faithfulness, then you can have this dynamic view of the future being filled with unknowns and it i i know that one of my commenters is going to say wait a minute god knows everything even about the future <laughs> but we don't know what knowing means yeah. either to say yeah. god knows everything about the future so knowing is is a question mark but let's picture this dynamic possibility in the future there are many different paths that could open up for us but the one thing we know is that God is always faithful and he is faithful to make of that what he is going to make of it, which yeah. is going to be something good or to bring it, it the back. The mechanics to about how thing. God does what he does is less important, but sometimes we can get, we can stumble over that. Um, yeah. When people get into like, well, well, God definitely knows this. He definitely knows that. Well, I, 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 I finally, we it, that? <laughs> exactly. Well, what does that even mean? Like we're, 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 like our language isn't it isn't precise or or deep enough to describe ourselves to ourselves and yet you know applying it to that scale is kind of in my opinion kind of laughable and i mean uh, i think it does trip us up it creates uh, anytime you've created a box that god has to live and perform in you're probably wrong but i do think you're right in terms of you know it's a better rather than unchanging faithful is better it's it's about it's about kind of uh, this relationship with something that is trust um yeah and that makes me um 
did you did you read the little bit i the portion i sent you on the um on what solzhenitsyn said about the dostoevsky quote uh about uh, beauty will save the world yes i did i i read quite a bit of that um i went back in and i read several paragraphs about it but i because I did all this Esther Meek stuff afterwards, I've kind of okay. <laughs> it overwrote that portion. Just refreshed my memory. I overrode. My <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I don't know that 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 phrase in the book always kind of struck me with in Dostoevsky. So I was really pleased to 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 stumble across across Solzhenitsyn having a commentary on it, and he he basically says that like truth, uh, goodness, and beauty are kind of like these trees that that all kind of grow together mm -hmm. and that like, and, and he even saw this in his own lifetime that we, we have altered, we've kind of trimmed the trees of truth and goodness. Like we've, we've, he even saw this in the Soviet union in his own life, you know, it, it, the truth became a lie, you know, it became so subverted, you know, and he saw, you know, the, the idea of what was good and evil changed. The goodness got rewritten, but this idea that, that there's something about beauty that is undeniable and, and it, it, you can't, you can't with your intellect to deny beauty and you can't like pull it apart and be like, no, that's not beautiful. You know, you, it kind of, it seizes you and apprehends you in a way that you can't, it's, it's undeniable. Um, and I, I found that really moving and compelling because it, it's, it's kind of been, I feel like a lot of my own experience away from faith and back to it was, it was, I'd say, the best word to describe it would be beauty would be like the thing that would had led me on because I, there's just a sense that there's, there's something here that's real and undeniable. And specifically I knew it was something that was more complex and detailed than I could have manufactured, you know, that I could have just like popped into my imagination and created this, you know, so that, that it was, there was something in that, that, um, uh, again, achieved what, you know, our suppression of truth and goodness, you know, beauty still was able to achieve it in a, in a way that, that, that kind of, um, that, that got there. Because I think, I think that is one of the biggest things that you see in the modern world is this, these attempts to rewrite both truth and, and goodness in our own well, way. I, what I see in the modern world is an attempt to rewrite beauty. We certainly see that with a lot of the public art that is being put in the public squares is intentionally yeah. um, as grotesque and um, confrontative as it can be. And the museums are increasingly gravitating towards that kind of art. Um, and there's an attempt to overwrite beauty, but that will yeah. fail yeah. because beauty yeah. exists in the world independent of what man makes and what how man creates everywhere you look i mean just this morning we were on a walk and looking at the the light coming through the trees and one of the things i noticed is that when the when the light was shining sideways into this tree that was all lit up with fall colors it was just evanescent and then when we were walking home the light was on the tree it was less it was less beautiful because the light was so forcefully on the tree rather than coming through the tree. And that made me think of this, somewhere along the line, I ran into this thing about the Lycur Lycurgus or Lycurgus glass. Have you ever heard of that? Mm -mm. It's an actual glass, like a chalice that was um, made by somebody that it was made of color changing glass. So that if the light is coming through the glass, it's this beautiful deep red. But if the light is on the glass, it's a kind of a lovely milk, opaque, light green. Huh. I mean, I, I don't know how it was done, but it's fascinating to look at and to think about that when we allow the light to come through us, we are, net, we are transparent or do we have to be transparent in order to allow the light to come through us? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when the light is on us <clears throat> and we're opaque, there's something there. I, I, I can't quite put my finger on it, but there's something of a deep nature there between transparency and opacity that is very interesting thing that I'd like to explore in my brain, but I 
I thought about it just before I got on you here. You might so want to I read explored it too far. There's, C.S. Lewis has this great essay called the, the Weight of Glory. Have you read that? I have, but it was a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's really good. But he, agenda what, 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 what you were just saying there made me think of he taught his concept of glory. And, 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 and what glory is, is kind of like this. It's, it's, it's being known by God, which is a, is a kind of a weird thing. Like, cause he, he, he talks about how, how like, you know, when he, when he, when he saw these ancient writers talking about glory, he was kind of like put off by it. He's like, well, it's like, it seems like you just want to be famous or something. And like, it's this weird kind of, it seems to me like a wicked desire. And then, but really what it, what it boils down to is this kind of, uh, to be, to be known deeply by God. And that made me think of the, the light kind of shining through. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> because, okay, so here, so, so if, if I am this, um, if myself is this matrix that is, filled in by all the things that I know and learn and everything as I'm growing. Um, but when, when God's light is shining through me, it, that is shining through that mesh network that I am through all of those things that I know and am known and everything so that they are all invested. They are all informed. They are all, embodied it's not the right word but brought to life permeated permeated with god's light moving mm -hmm. through me if it's if i'm if i'm allowing god's light to move through me then it's permeating every part of me and changing every part of what i know and think and 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 i th that may be what esther is talking about when she talks about how knowing is really the foundation of knowing is having that interpersonal relationship with god that covenantal relationship with him is what it means to know anything yeah that's where all knowing abides is in him yeah well and this idea too that the love comes first and then the knowledge later um that there's something about that you bind yourself to a thing whatever it is whether it's to gaining a certain skill like riding a bike or to knowing a certain person and and that that binding to and that that patience that that unfolding over time is what enables knowledge to occur it, it's again an expectation an invitation for that disclosure of reality that can't happen Again, if, if if you come at it with a I'm gonna push the buttons kind of mentality and get what I want, you just you've immediately closed off. You're like you've 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 put over a frame on it that will never allow you to see what's really there. Um and we do we do that a lot, I think. And, and because oftentimes it is useful. You can, you know, you can get what you want out of people if you push their buttons a lot of times. I like the way you put that, that the, the love comes first when you bind yourself to a commitment, either to knowing a person or knowing a skill or to knowing God. Um, that, that's maybe a good place to stop. What do you think? Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> this has been a great conversation, Michael. Thank you for bringing Esther Lightcap me to my salience register. And, uh, I, I look forward to learning more about her. Yeah. Is she still living? Yeah, yeah. She's um she teaches at a college up in Pennsylvania, a little tiny college in West Because she she's completely absent on social media. Um there huh. are no new there are the the newest video I could find of her was three or four years old and her website is only a register of the books that she's written and there's no her blogging website ceased blogging like in 2009 so there are some are some interesting blog um no i'm sorry 2015 there are some interesting blogs from 2015 but then that's the end of that website and then you have to look at the other website which is just strictly a list of her books hmm. yeah i don't 
I don't know. Um, but I, I know she's, she's still active in teaching at the Geneva college. Cause I would love to have a conversation with her. <laughs> yeah. You should reach out to her. I'm sure. I she, did. I, I like contacted kind of her from her website and okay. uh, yeah, cause it would be really interesting to have a conversation with her. Oh, I hope you do. That'd be great. Okay. Have a great day, Michael. Talk to you later. Yeah, you too. Bye. Bye.